Thank you everyone for joining us today for this panel organized by the International Manifesto Group or IMG. It is titled Understanding the Taiwan Question and Cross-Strait Relations. So to start off, I'll give some brief um, introductory remarks and then we will have uh, two speakers who I will introduce momentarily to give a present to give two presentations followed by an hour Q&A session. So as the U.S. empire declines, it is becoming more aggressive and bellicose in its foreign policy, specifically towards nations and regions it views as peer competitors or rivals. This can be seen clearly in the U.S.'s foreign policy when it comes to Russia and China. Today's most uh, dangerous conflicts in terms of their human and economic costs, both current and potential to escalate out of control, is the U.S.-led NATO-backed proxy war in Ukraine and rising tensions with the People's Republic of China specifically in its willingness to cross the PRC's red lines over Taiwan province. Uh, these tensions include a U.S.-led economic war started by the Trump administration, placing trade barriers and tariffs on certain Chinese goods, and it has been further escalated with the Biden administration's chip ban aimed at slowing down China's technological progress in that field. The U.S.'s rec reckless unilateral actions in the field of economic warfare do not follow international law and likely neither the rules laid out by the WTO. However, economic warfare on its own has little uh, chance of escalating into a full-blown military conflict. On the other hand, U.S. provocations over Taiwan are increasingly dangerous and lead us closer and closer to full-scale military conflict with the potential to escalate into a nuclear war. Uh, the U.S. can no longer compete <clears throat> economically. With China, so in the near future, it may try to shift the conflict away from the economic one and towards a military one. And Taiwan has been an incredibly hot subject recently with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's uh, visit in August, which prompted a PRC military exercise that essentially acted as a temporary blockade of the island. And many people in the West view Taiwan as a bastion of freedom, democracy, and human rights compared with the totalitarian authoritarian dictatorship of the PRC. Today we are joined by two great speakers who are going to go deeper into some of these myths and questions and dispel uh, these misconceptions <clears throat> the Taiwan question and cross-strait relations uh, between the mainland China and Taiwan. So the new Cold War led by the U.S. against China has spurred mischaracterizations and leveraged the Taiwan question for U.S. geopolitical gains Against the backdrop of the recent uh, Russia-Ukraine war, some people erroneously compare Taiwan with Ukraine. Speakers of this panel, both from Taiwan, will address these misconceptions in the West about the Taiwan question and provide a historical and geopolitical understanding of the issues in context of the U.S.-led Cold War. They will also share the experiences and perspectives of Taiwanese fishermen and uh, discuss how the current movement for protecting the Jiayu Tai territory uh, links people of the mainland and Taiwan across the Taiwan Strait. Finally, speakers of the panel will discuss the various, uh, sorry, the visions for cross-strait relations. Uh, the speakers will be joined by two discussants, myself, Brandon Love, and I, I guess not, was supposed to have Su Sung here, hopefully they'll join in a little bit, and who will provide a progressive East Asian regional perspective on the Taiwan question. So before I introduce today's speakers, I want to briefly thank the International Manifesto Group and everybody involved uh, behind the scenes who make who make these events possible. Without the hard work of many volunteers and organizers and donors, this work would not be possible. And the core of our analysis is our manifesto through, per, through pluripolarity to socialism. And we believe engagement with its themes uh, engagement with its themes to develop them further is important for further left advance. So please read the manifesto, share it with your contacts, and sign it if you agree with its broad themes. Uh, you're also welcome to volunteer for the organization. That's how I got involved. And we also accept donations to make um, hosting webinars such as these possible. So with that said, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Thomas Huang. He was born and grew up in Taiwan. He obtained his BA in law from National Taiwan University in Taipei, and then JD Magnum Cum Laude from Robert H. Uh, McKinney Law School of Indiana University and SJD from Harvard Law School in the United States. After practicing law as partners in the U.S. for many years, he taught law and stayed in Taiwan for nearly 10 years. He's been active and 
He's been in civic and pro bono activities and <laughs> served as the rapporteur of the court and petitioners council in several cases before the Taiwan's before Taiwan's constitutional court. In 2003, he was selected by ABA and UNDP to Hanoi as a specialist advising Vietnamese, the Vietnamese government on issues relating to its WTO admission for membership. Dr. Huang has authored books and articles on various subjects, both in English and Chinese. He has been listed in Mar Marquis Who's Who in American Law for many years and was voted by his peers as one of the super lawyers for the year 2004 and 2005 in Massachusetts, USA. He recently drafted a petition for national referendum demanding a peace conference on behalf of a group of peace activists in Taiwan. So Thomas, feel free to take it away and just I'm ready to share your PowerPoint whenever you need it. Do you want to introduce uh, Professor Chen first before we go? Oh, on? sure. I can I can do it now. I was going to wait before them, but so our second speaker today will be uh, Professor Chen Meixia, Emeritus Professor of Public Health at National Chen Kung University in Taiwan and President of the Diao Yutai Education Association. She has been an academic activist since the 1970s after she was enlightened by and then involved in protecting the Yao Yutai Islands movement. Uh, hi, everyone. Um... I want to thank uh, I, IMG and the co-host of today's meeting for allowing me to discuss some of the issues vitally, which are vitally important to world peace and are very close to my heart. Uh, that is the uh, cross strait relationships between the PRC and Taiwan. I would assume most of you in the audience have some familiarity with the situation in Ukraine and the conflict between uh, you, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. So my talk will be mostly concentrated on the issue of Taiwan, the situation in Taiwan. And because of the time constraint, I probably would uh, do uh, some PowerPoint uh, type of analysis uh, and uh, leave most of the time uh, in my section for Q&A later. Uh, I don't want to force uh, some discussions on topics which you are familiar or are not interested. I'm a true believer of Plato that uh, only dialogues will lead to wisdom, not lecturing. Now, next. Now, during the last few years, a lot of commentators, scholars, and decision makers have warned the world that Taiwan probably is the most dangerous place on Earth in terms of causing a military conflict between the United States and China involving Taiwan, and which may lead to the second, a third world war, and even nuclear exchanges. Now, after the uh, Ukrainian Russian conflict, this prophecy seems to become even more obvious than before. Now, Taiwan, of course, is different from, uh, from Ukraine in many different uh, aspects, historically, geographically, and legal, politically. But there are uh, strikingly similar uh, developments in both areas 
which uh, confirm the warning from uh, many, many commentators that the cross straight relationships at this point are very unstable. And if nothing is done about these relationships, disaster may occur in the near future. Next, uh, next slide. Now, before we get into uh, some details, I just want to give you an overview of the similarities between Ukraine and Taiwan in their current uh, political situation, particularly the uh, Taiwan's relationship with uh, the, the PRC on the mainland China. Taiwan, like uh, Ukraine, is facing a, a, a very powerful neighbor, which is China, and which is very much concerned with their national security interests. And Taiwan and Ukraine are also similar in one respect, that is, they are both a heavily divided societies with severe ethnical and group conflicts. For the situation of Taiwan is even more because of the long separation between the mainland China and Taiwan. Both areas actually develop different cultures and values to some extent, which make the uh, the uh, these two groups of people very sometimes very difficult to get along or see things the same way. Ukraine and Taiwan, although started the uh, the so-called democratic situation, probably. Uh, from the same period of time, in, in other words, in the, in the in nineties, in in uh, in in the nineties, uh, they are both very young and young uh, experimental uh, areas for democratic processes and practices. They. Although they both have uh, universal suffrage, unfortunately, they collect, uh, elected, both of them elected very corrupt political uh, leaders. There's also another very uh, peculiar uh, area, which is that uh, both countries or both areas develop some type of private militia groups. We are we we all we are all familiar with the situation in U Ukraine. The Taiwan situation probably is not uh, as obvious as uh, people think. We may or may not uh, get into uh, this particular area, but uh, it's worth mentioning. Uh, at the same time, I think both. Ukraine and Taiwan have elected very unrealistic and corrupt political leaders who are not particularly familiar with international real politics and basically have adopted a wrong external policy, in my view, to deal with their very strong neighbors. Next. Next slide, yeah. When we talk about, uh, so during the last few years, when I lecture all over the place, talking about <laughs> Taiwan being uh, 
acting in a way to threaten the core interest, core national interest of China. Most of the people do not understand what I was talking about in the first uh, at the beginning. Therefore, I think it's probably important for me to explain a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit uh, academic, what the core interest means. Under the uh, tradition of uh, for foreign policy of the of the British Empire, the national interest should be divided or differentiated in two different types. One type is called core interests. For that country will fight to death. It takes it takes what uh, it, it it will give whatever it takes to fight in order to preserve this kind of interest. But on the other hand, there are national interests which are not vital, uh, not the particular vital, but those are expected or uh, expected national interests which can be adjusted according to the circumstances. I give you an example. During the 18th century, the United States was rising, become a rising power, which did not trigger the fear on the part of the British Empire. Because the British Empire believes that the United States and the most Americans probably share their values and the United States was located in the place where it's far from the Europe, far from Europe. Therefore, the rise of the United States did not cause the concern on the part of the United King Kingdom at that particular point. Now, when China says, uh, so next, next, next uh, slide. Oh, no, go 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 back to the previous one. So when the China says that Taiwan issue is their core national interest, that means this kind of interest is not sub subject to negotiation or can be easily uh, thrown away. You know, as the uh, me, uh, the the uh, meeting, uh, G20 meeting, uh, at you know, President Biden and Xi uh, exchanged various views, but Xi Jinping made it very clear that Taiwan issue is the most vital national interest among all the core interests of China. So there's absolutely no room for negotiation or for playing with this, uh, this particular issue. We may say that uh, China probably was uh, bluffing. I don't think so. Because I, I know that during the Cold War, there was secret negotiation between the United States and China for, if I'm not mistaken, for 17 years in Warsaw, the most contentious issues among all the other uh, important or not, not very important issues, Taiwan issue stood out. And that was the issue which could not be agreed on by both sides at that particular point. Now, the change came only in uh, 1979 when the United States started to express some uh, willingness to negotiate to compromise. Next. Now, when we say that the Taiwan and uh, both Taiwan and, and uh, Ukraine are divided society. This is one of the examples. The Taiwan 
is hardly a very mature democracy. This is a picture of all the legislators in physical fights during the session, congressional session. And the political processes are far from being smooth and effective. Uh, and then this situation continued from the end of the martial, martial law in 19, uh, at the end of 1980s uh, up to the present time. Next. And this kind of uh, divided society uh, is a problem for the uh, for for uh, for both countries because they cannot come up with a uh, consensus on their external policies. Now, some people, uh, some politicians call the blue forces in Taiwan, and some are uh, being called the green forces. They basically had different perspectives as to what should be done vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the PRC. So it's very difficult for them to come up with an effective and unified policy to deal with the, the external uh, threats. Now, one of the uh, most ridiculous ideas or myths uh, concerning the situation in Taiwan is that uh, just like uh, Pelosi uh, said the other day when he visited uh, Taiwan. The struggle of Taiwan represents democracies versus external autocracies. Nothing is far from, more far from the truth. Now, the, we uh, alluded to uh, only a few, uh, a few seconds ago that uh, Taiwan is a divided uh, society and have elected the uh, incompetent politicians. And they are also very difficult to come up with a unified uh, external policies to deal with the danger they are facing. And their political processes, particularly the relationship between two parties and the branches, different branches of the government are function, functioning very poorly. They're far from being an effective or, uh, uh, you know, the uh, democracy at all. So it's certainly not a, a, a model of democracy and freedom as presented by some of the uh, politicians, some American politicians. Now, we all know that uh, only the adoption of universal suffrage in infant democracies like Taiwan and Europe and, and Ukraine is not a sufficient and necessary and sufficient condition for the country to be called a mat mature democracy. In case of Taiwan, the uh, elections actually cause alliances of power and money and favors, which is probably even more severe problems than other more mature democracies in the world. So just like uh, Mill, Stuart Mill warned that uh, election or democratic system may sometimes controlled by people, voters, who are less educated and less qualified. Therefore, their judgment may not be the best for the society to, uh, for any country to adopt. And during the last four years, when the present government came into power, a different situation uh, arose. That is, the ruling party has a total control of the of Congress, and um, um, the membership is almost two thirds of all the uh, 
elected uh, representatives. They basically can pass anything they want and block anything the opposition party would like to have. So this is what Tocqueville called the tyranny of majority. And both things happen in Taiwan. So Taiwan is far from a democracy as some of the people would like to think. Next page. Particularly during the last uh, few years, there's an erosion of personal prop, uh, liberties in terms of freedom of expression, uh, freedom of press, and to some extent, freedom of associations. And during the uh, period of martial law uh, before 1990s, uh, Taiwan actually experienced about, fit for about 50 years of uh, dictatorship. Of course, there will be there. There was no uh, judicial integrity or uh, independence to speak of. But the situation has not improved uh, since the uh, abolition of uh, martial law. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, the situation has grown even worse in some areas. If people like to me to cite uh, you know, specific examples, uh, we can do that in, uh, during the Q&A uh, session. Now there's uh, the Taiwan's judicial integrity and independence was rated in 2017 and 2018 as number 48 in the world, which of course is far ahead of uh, that in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, if I'm not mistaken, was ranked about 129. The interesting thing is that mainland China with PRC judiciary against all our presumption and expectations was ranked number 46 before Taiwan in the same year. Now, Taiwan people are under an illusion that because they have universal suffrage, therefore they are very free and very democratic. They're so different from mainland China or any other world that they prefer to be left alone or be, or some even say that they would like to have independent country because they would like to preserve uh, the values they cherish the most. I agree that universal suffrage is a, is a great achievement, but that alone can hardly qualify Taiwan as, as vibrant uh, or the vibrant uh, democracy in the world. Next uh, page, next page. Now we talk about the uh, election of corrupt politicians or politicians who are not uh, experienced in uh, international situation or real politics. And this is the, the example. This guy is the Minister of uh, Public Health and Welfare. And he has many, many uh, strange uh, uh, policies uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, if we have enough time, I'll be very happy to get into, uh, give you people some of the very specific uh, policy uh, which, in my opinion, uh, constitutes uh, gross negligence, if not uh, sim if not criminal uh, conducts. Now, 
uh, in addition to the minister, this minister, but I, you know, because the picture is so funny, so I, I selected this. The president of current government, uh, Ms. Tsai, has also been subject to uh, uh, personal scandals. Now, this is a very interesting uh, story. Uh, after you uh, listen to my uh, uh, characterization, you probably will understand what kind of uh, leaders uh, Taiwan people have at this very point and what kind of national security issues uh, have been created by having this kind of incompetent and corrupt politicians in charge. Now, Ms. Tsai allegedly was graduated from London School of Economics. Uh, and she, at one point, she came back to Taiwan claiming that she had a PhD degree in law from uh, University of London uh, and was uh, therefore appointed as professor at one of the law schools. And from then, from that time on, she then climbed the ladder, political uh, ladder and finally became president of, the, uh, of Taiwan. At one point, he claimed that he was, she, she claimed that she was afforded not just one PhD degree in law, but 1.5 degree, which is impossible. So that <laughs> angered some of the uh, academians and the uh, media people. So they challenged her, saying that you really don't have a PhD degree from uh, from the University of London. If you do, show us the evidence, your certificate or your diplomas or your uh, dissertation. And Miss Tsai couldn't do it. Instead, she uh, will at least acquiesce in um, having her records, original records for, for the application of the professorship sealed as top national security interest not to be revealed in 30 years. Now, 30 years from now, everybody concerned probably will, will be dead by then. So then uh, Ms. Tsai brought the lawsuit of defamation against one of the accusers. And that accuser happened to be my, uh, a friend of mine, has been charged with a criminal indictment for defamation. And he's actually in exile in the United States for the last two years without being able to renew his passport. Regardless of the fact, the Taiwan has been the signatory of the UN Convention on Political and Civic Rights, which specifically prohibits the revocation of visa and denial of right to return to home country or leave one's own country. So that shows you how much freedom uh, is being enjoyed by, uh, by Taiwanese at this very point. In some respect, it's very free because you can defame other people, call other na people names, criticize the president if it's not uh, uh, being very vital. Uh, but on the other hand, when it comes to freedom of the press, and particularly the right to criticize political figures, the Taiwan is not that free. And that's exactly the opposite of what a democratic society must treat personal liberties. 
Tom, it's just a five minute warning, by the way. Oh, five minutes. Okay. Let me let me talk about the next next uh And the differences between Ukraine and Taiwan, there are many differences, of course. I have already explained that uh, losing Taiwan is or constitutes an ex ex existential threat to the PRC because of the historical reason, as you most of you may know. Taiwan was taken by Japan uh, after the uh, Sino-Japanese War in uh, 1895, after the uh, Chinese Navy's, uh, Navy was defeated by the Japanese Navy. And uh, as a result, China ceded uh, Taiwan to Japan and was returned to China at that particular in the nationalist government. Uh, in 1945, and because of the Korean War, uh, the communist forces could not, at that point, finish the civil war by taking Taiwan. Is uh, the seven, U.S. Seventh Fleet blocked the uh, the strait, and there was nothing uh, China could do at that particular point. So the PRC has always considered this an unfinished job of the civil war. And not only that, is Taiwan each taking Taiwan back is the almost the uh, uh, concerns the, the, the very existence and the glory of the nation. And after suffering uh, 150 years of uh, humiliation from foreign forces and foreign powers, there's no way that China would uh, relinquish, or there are other reasons, of course, can relinquish Taiwan and let Taiwan to become uh, independent or separate, separate de facto or de jure. Now, there are uh, other geographic differences and uh, demographic differences, which I am going to uh, to uh, to skip. Now, one of the most important differences between Ukraine and Taiwan is Ukraine is a sovereign country. It was even admitted by Russia in several international treaties after 1991, when Ukraine became independent. For example, in the non proliferation uh, of nuclear uh, powers uh, agreement uh, between France, Germany, uh, uh, Russia, and uh, United States and Ukraine. In order to persuade Ukraine to return all the nuclear arsenal back to, uh, back to Russia, they all agree that you know the existence of Ukraine has to be guaranteed, or the territorial integrity has to be guaranteed by all power by, by the world. So there's no question Ukraine is uh, is an independent country, sovereign country. But Taiwan situation is different. You're at one minute. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and so. You cannot treat the issue of Taiwan the same, exactly the same as Ukraine. It was thinking that you can do whatever you want uh, against uh, Chinese interests. Although the concept of uh, exclusive domestic jurisdiction is fluid, as the International Court would say in 19, back in 1922. But uh, the world opinion probably, in my opinion, would be on the side of China if uh, the, this issue ever comes up in the future. Uh, okay, next. I have 30 minutes already or what? Yeah, but if you just want to wrap 
Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, well, well, let me finish that no, because yeah, it only take about five or ten minutes, ten more minutes. Uh -huh. So the uh, the the situation in you in, in uh, we 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 are all frustrated by the situation in um, in Ukraine, and we can ask whether we are better off, the world is better off today than before the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. But the answer, of course, is very definite, no. Even Xi Jinping feels that, that the, the war affected the China's supply chain and their economic uh, development. And uh, during the uh, G20 uh, summit, post China, but both she and Biden expressed opinion that under no circumstances a nuclear weapon should be used in Ukraine. So that is this is a big headache for everybody. So we may think lightly before the conflict starts thinking that this is a normal way uh, the big powers resolve uh, their differences. But the resort is uh, very hard to bear for the entire world. Now, according to, you know, I, uh, you know, the Taiwan, well, the U.S. Some of the politicians in the United States may think, uh, you know, just, you know, Secretary Bowden the other day, for example, saying that Taiwan is a vital interest of the United States, and the United States should defend militarily Taiwan. But this is a very dangerous uh, proposal or proposition, as um, Professor. Paulson of MIT uh, once said that even if the containment policy becomes a necessity for whatever reason uh, on the part of the United States, Taiwan definitely geographically is not a place to make the last stand, just like uh, General Carter. Because it's geographically so close to mainland China. If everyone remembers the nuclear threat of nuclear war during the Cuban crisis in 1960s, it'd be crazy for us to believe that mainland China would not treat the issue of Taiwan the same way by risking a nuclear war over the issue of Taiwan. Now, um, you may, the audience is, uh, may allow me to be a little bit uh, philosophical. Now, there's a renaissance of uh, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory uh, since the 1970s, in which he said specifically that uh, the world, the, the, the human, human societies should not resolve their conflicts by violence or other means. Instead, the guiding principle for human size be that uh, families or villages or countries or in the entire world is through cooperation and sympathy and empathies among the human beings. Now that even the Adam Smith said that uh, so many words, not so many words, uh, a little bit earlier, he said the vital aspect of human behavior are the propensity to trade. Now you cannot uh, do in trade without cooperation. Unfortunately, 
we up to now most of the most of the powers in the world believe that the military confrontations are the legitimate and the useful way for solving uh, the, the differences and conflicts. Now, uh, the, uh, since I'm in a sort of philosophical mood, I may want to add a few remarks. Some wise people told us that uh, human beings do not invent the universe. Therefore, we are not expected to understand completely the nature. But on the other hand, values, systems, cultures are human inventions. There's no reason that we don't understand them and we cannot make them the way we want them to be. Now, even though Aristotle was once alluded to as saying that the human beings are the only animals which has the reasoning power and the capability to make speeches. I don't want to argue with Aristotle, obviously. But human beings are also the only animals which can come up with devices and instruments to kill each other. And now probably do it massively and completely. Some wise people also told us that human beings do not come to this world voluntarily. We are being thrown into this world with expectation to live our, our natural lives. Therefore, military confrontations are the inventions and follies and bad habits of human beings, which work against almost everybody's hope to live out their natural life and only to die once from not war, natural causes. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, second. Oops. Thank you for that presentation, Thomas. That was great. And sorry to um, interrupt you a few times. Um, we will still, have, we'll still have lots of time for Q&A and um, but I'll introduce our next speaker, Professor uh, Chen Meixia, and I will share your slides right now. One second. Sure. Uh, thank you, Brandon. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to have this uh, opportunity uh, to ponder with you the most complex issue, the Taiwan question nowadays. Uh, before I uh, start my presentation, uh, I want to make two quick notes. One, I'm not really the expert in this area. Um, my expertise is in public health, uh, but I have been uh, uh, active, active uh, in progressive uh, movements. So my uh, Chinese friends wanted me to share the experience. So this, uh, I, I hope um, my presentation uh, serves the purpose of uh, uh, raising the issues for our more uh, discussions. Second, uh, I have been, I have moved from uh, the US to uh, Taiwan uh, for many years and my uh, communication language is mostly Chinese. So uh, English has been, uh, uh, not my uh, major uh, uh, communication uh, language. So if you would uh, bear with me, if uh, uh, 
I uh, 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 have some problems of uh, my communication. So uh, let me uh, get into my talk. Uh, the uh, a topic, as you can see here, Chinese or Taiwanese, question mark, unification or independence, question mark. And I say here is the ideology, stupid. And you all know that this is uh, uh, in 1992, uh, uh, Clinton's uh, uh, strategist uh, termed this. Yeah. And, and here in this, the first page, uh, you can see on the right, uh, uh, the map of uh, uh, on the left side is uh, the uh, uh, China and Fukan and uh, then Taiwan. And, and there's the tunnel uh, uh, passage between these two uh, sides, but it, this is not real. This is uh, uh, the, just the design ideas. So this makes a very, uh, the, the problem that we are going to talk about very, very interesting. So next. Okay, N let me uh, uh, start with, uh, uh, what do we mean, what do we mean by uh, the Taiwan question? <clears throat> so I will talk very briefly about the origin of Taiwan question. First, in 1949, KMT uh, was defeated by CCP, as everybody knows. And then C uh, KMT retreated to Taiwan. That's the first uh, situation. And second, after the World War II, the hostility between capitalist uh, camp and uh, uh, the uh, socialist camp, and you know that the capitalist uh, uh, camp was led by uh, the US and uh, the socialist camp by USSR. The hostility between these two camps has become uh, the major contradictions. Okay. And third, uh, US imperialism intervened in the CCP and KMT civil war. And US clearly supported uh, KMT, financial, uh, military, and other resources. Uh, next. And third, this is extremely important. In 1950, uh, it happened that Korean War uh, started. Yeah. And the US uh, imperialist uh, containment policy uh, was uh, started and to curtail uh, the expansion of communism, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, China. Uh, and Taiwan thus become the key part of the containment. And U.S. Um, uh, 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 intervened in, in this uh, internal affairs and uh, 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 Taiwan became uh, the front line of uh, uh, this uh, 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 containment. And third, uh, the fifth, uh, the uh, US Cold War uh, ideology uh, started very clearly. Uh, uh, anti and, and the theme is anti-communist, liberalism, modernization theory, Western democracy, individual freedom, human rights, and Western democracy. And sixth, Taiwan, from all the above uh, was blocked from mainland China and came the Taiwan question. Yeah. So cross-strait uh, cross relations uh, since then have been in trouble, the waters. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to strengthen what I just said, uh, that uh, the China and Taiwan Taiwan is very, very important uh, for uh, the, the Pacific area here and also very important for PRC. And as you can see, uh, this, uh, um, uh, the chain, the island chain, Taiwan is one of the, uh, we would say is uh, like luck hole. And so it's very important uh, for uh, China. Okay, next. Okay, well, for this Taiwan question, they, of course, there are many consequences. I will use one uh, to show it here. Uh, from 1992, this is the survey by uh, uh, the university uh, in Taiwan. Uh, the green is uh, the, uh, those people, that this is about the identity. Yeah. The, uh, 
the identity of the people in Taiwan. Uh, the, the green one is the one who think that, as uh, you can see, Taiwanese, they are Taiwanese, okay? And then uh, uh, the, uh, the purple one is uh, the Taiwanese and, and the Chinese. Both, you know, I'm a Chinese, but I'm also Taiwanese. And then the blue one is uh, like, I'm a Chinese. Okay. Uh, the black one is that they don't have any opinion. So you can see here is very clearly uh, the change on, uh, from 92. I would say that before 92, there's no, no such survey, but before 92, uh, it's more clear that uh, the blue would be really up, uh, up uh, to almost 100%. And then uh, the green is very low. Okay. So this is one of the consequences. Okay, uh, next. Yeah. But if we look at Taiwan and China, historically, up to now, there are no wars, no conflicts be between men in China and Taiwan. Yeah. So why there is such cross-strait relation in troubled waters for decades? And we need to ponder on that next. And uh, well, I would go back to the history of global cap capitalism. In view of the history of global capitalism, the Taiwan question is not unique. Okay. Uh, for the uh, imperialist countries to expand capital, export, and open new markets, particularly we know historically Asia, Latin America, Africa, they need to frequently start aggression, uh, wars, support a puppet or provisional regime, uh, and they uh, promoted separatism and instigated ethnic conflicts. And I say here uh, that uh, uh, KMT as the provisional or puppet regime, okay, and promoted separatism is what we are talking about here, the, uh, divide between uh, China and, and Taiwan, and ethnic conflicts and hostility between these two sides. Okay. And so I think with this, I would say that it is the ideology. Okay. Uh, but I also want to say that ideology has its material basis. Okay. Next. But I also want to say that the history of Taiwan uh, as part of China uh, and the history of the Taiwan question, the history of cross-strait relations is unique. So I would say that the, the mainstream, uh, say Taiwan and Ukraine uh, can be compared, I think is inappropriate. Okay? And I think our panel is to defuse that, okay? like Dr. Wang Huang said. Okay? And uh, PRC, uh, 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 later part, I'm going to mostly talk about Taiwan, but here I want to make a note that PRC policy toward Taiwan question is loud and clear and consistent since the 1950s. And, and their policy, the, the PRC policy is Taiwan question is China's internal affairs. When it concerns international issues, they stick to one China policy, okay? Uh, Taiwan's part of China, okay, and strongly oppose uh, the uh, intervene uh, the, the, to to the attempt to inter uh, internationalize Taiwan question. Strongly oppose intervention of other countries. Okay, prefers the use of peaceful solution, and this is very clear since 1950s. Uh, next. Well, if we talk about, I'm, I'm into Taiwan now. Taiwan's political, economic development, historically, we need to have a good understanding to understand the Taiwan question and to understand the cross-strait relations. 1940, this is very brief, uh, 1945 to 1959, Taiwan uh, uh, economic policies, mostly land reform, import substitution, and constrain the private capital, expand the uh, state capital. But with the uh, input, strong input of the US, okay, 
uh, it changed in 1960 and 1980s. Okay? And, and uh, Taiwan adopted uh, S4 oriented policy. And uh, KMT, uh, from the very beginning, is the author, uh, used the authoritarian uh, rule. And, and then encouraged the private capital. And with this process of about 20 years uh, or 30 years, indigenous newly rise capitalist class grew significantly. This is very important for Taiwan independence uh, uh, analysis. Okay. So in the 1990s to, and after that, uh, 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 came blue, we call blue and green. Uh, uh, blue, the KMT and then the green DPP uh, the capitalist uh, class uh, uh, started adopting uh, very systematically Western democracy, neoliberalism, deregulation, privatization, worsened uh, class inequality. In this whole process of several decades, the major actors are, of course, KMT and DP, DPP capitalist class, uh, and also US uh, regime, US hegemony, and Japanese uh, regime, very important actors. Okay, next. And uh, I want to, you know, talking about the cross relate, uh, cross strait relations and Taiwan question, I want to mention a few major political and historic events influencing uh, the issue uh, that we are talking about. In 1945, Japan colonization ended. You know, and Japan colonized uh, Taiwan for 50 years. And because of uh, the uh, Second World War, uh, uh, Japan surrendered and uh, returned uh, Taiwan and also Diao Yutai Island. I'm going to talk about, and I'm very heavily involved in the Diao Yutai uh, movement, so I'm going to talk about it later. Uh, but then in 1945 and 50, uh, CCP and KMT civil war, there is a civil war and US intervention, uh, very strong intervention and support the KMT uh, regime. In okay. 1950, I just mentioned that uh, there was Korean War. And with this Korean War, the US, uh, in order to prevent the expansion of PRC's influence, US included Taiwan in the containment strategy. Thus, Taiwan uh, was in, incorporated into the US-led Far East anti-communist, anti-Chinese Cold War front line. Next. Okay. And then uh, I'm talking about, you know, the history of uh, uh, Taiwan economic uh, and political economic development. In 1950 and to 1970, this period of about 20 years, two decades, uh, uh, U.S. had very strong influence, and, and in 1954, uh, there was a U, uh, mutual defense treaty between U.S. and ROC, uh, Republic of China and Taiwan. Uh, uh, it's very clear U.S. intervention, uh, and then U.S. tried to uh, push for two China or one China, one Taiwan policy, okay? and provided enormous uh, economic assistance. And, and Taiwan was under martial law, and there was white tailor, state white tailor, uh, uh, during this period of time. So under this uh, uh, two decades, in this two decades, it was there was systematic U.S. ideological propaganda machine, educational system, media, and other propaganda machine, study abroad program. I, I was, you know, I will talk about it later. I was one of them. Uh, benefited from this uh, uh, policy um, uh, with fellowship foundations, uh, Asian uh, foundation, very clear. Okay. And the main theme of this machine, ideological uh, control is anti-communist, liberalism, modernization theory, universal values, uh, the, uh, individual, individual freedom, human rights, uh, Western democracy, anti-Chinese, pro-America. Okay. Next. But then uh, in the 1970s, everybody knows there was, uh, I call it the Eric era. The world turned into the left. 
left Lenin, student movement, anti-imperialist movement, uh, Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War, anti-racism, anti-capitalism, anti-colonization, anti-militarism. That was the world, 1970s. And many in China was having the Cultural Revolution in the, 70, in the uh, 60s and 70s. And then Taiwan, uh, with this, all of this, um, uh, there was a movement protecting the Delta Island movement. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it was in US, I was the one uh, enlightened by uh, this movement. I was in the US, uh, in Hong Kong, Europe, and other uh, 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 some other part of uh, uh, Taiwan. And uh, this movement in the uh, beginning was patriotic, but then in 1971, because of the whole world atmosphere, uh, it, it turned to the left. Yeah. Uh, and this uh, uh, migrated to uh, Taiwan and uh, have a great influence uh, in Taiwan uh, and led to the indigenous literature reflection debate. Okay? And uh, uh, this debate is about the reversal of anti-communist liberalism and modernization uh, ideology. Uh, next. Okay. And what I was talking about the uh, uh, protecting the island movement, and then uh, this is uh, these are the islands, the uh, Delta Islands, and uh, and we have uh, the movement, and and this island has a, a very strong political economic interest, fish farm, seabed oil, natural gas reserve, and geopolitical power. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay. I say that in the 1970s is a really the left leaning and it's very frequent era uh, uh, in uh, the whole world. Uh, but in the 1980s, 90s, up to present, uh, there was a great reversal of this political atmosphere. And, and Taiwan under this is, uh, has been under several decades of anti-communist education, martial law, white tailor, cold world, ideology, okay? And then also I just mentioned that there was a rise of the indigenous new capitalist class. And this class insists or uh, strongly uh, uh, wanted uh, indigenous uh, consciousness and thus independence, Taiwan independence, okay? And in the 1990s, okay, uh, uh, it started the disinization this was difficult. And uh, uh, K KMT, but also DP DPP is even more. And the mainstream ideology uh, uh, with this uh, change, uh, the great reversal is anti-communist, anti-Chinese, more support for Taiwan independence and pro-American, uh, pro-Japanese. Okay. And, and we all know that Japan is the colonizer, was the colonizer of Taiwan for half a century. Uh, next. Uh, so uh, I want to get into uh, very briefly uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, visit. And I think with the history I just uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, of uh, the Taiwan question, the relation, the cross strait relations, uh, and, and several decades of uh, US intervention ideological control. Nancy Pelosi's visit and DPP's welcoming response and PRC's angry and strong reaction is unsurprising to me. It's unsurprising and even expected. Okay, next. Well, you know, I just talk about, <laughs> spend some uh, time uh, to talk about uh, the uh, 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 Taiwan question, and, and we know that is, I uh, say that is uh, ideological control. Well, how do we break through the ideological control? Yeah, I, I must say that this indeed is the little strength, uh, little strength versus big well fight. It's very difficult, you know, it's the whole world, it's the US, the hegemonic uh, state. Okay. But I would want to encourage us, okay, if we can analyze how ideology was developed, we can break through it by changing the structure and environment which led to the formation of the ideology. I think this is a, a Jen, 
uh, Frederick Jameson say something like that. But I think you know pe people on the panel, uh, like Brendan, like uh, Hiro, like uh, Shoumei, would all agree and you know, you know have it in in our mind. Yeah. And well, how to do it? I would use the protecting uh, the Diao Yutai Island movement as an example. Uh, next. A very short history of Diao Yutai Island, which uh, is very similar to, to, to what uh, the history of Taiwan and the relationship between China and Taiwan. The end of 19th century, you know, the, uh, Japan has a major reform, okay, and it gets uh, got on the road of capitalism, and it, it need to open up the, the new territories and this militarism, and Taiwan and Diao Yutai Islands became the major part targets okay, for its expansion. And so in uh, 1894, <clears throat> Japan started Sino-Japanese War. Okay, in Chinese, we call it Jiawu Zhenzhen. In 1995, and, you know, Qin Dynasty uh, was defeated, a very weak uh, regime. And uh, uh, Taiwan and affiliated islands and Diao Yutai Islands was uh, became colonized by Japan. So in this period of time of 50 years, half century, 1895 to 1945, Taiwan and all these islands and Diao Yutai Islands were colonized for half century. Only to 1945, uh, World War II ended, Japan uh, has uh, unconditional surrender. Taiwan and Diao Yutai Island return uh, to China. Okay, next. Yeah. And this is uh, it's very, I think, familiar with uh, uh, our audience. Uh, the 1943 Cairo Declaration and the 1945 Potsdam uh, Proclamation uh, very clearly uh, say that Japan must return all territories stolen from China including Taiwan and Diao Yutai Islands. Okay, next. Okay, uh, continue with. So 1945 to 1960, uh, 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 Diao Yutai Island uh, was part of the US trust territories. Okay. And Taiwan fishermen can freely fish, fish at the Diao Yutai uh, uh, fish hub farm. Okay. But in 1970, uh, this rings the bell about the, uh, the, my, the history I talked about uh, at the beginning. To consolidate the US and Japan anti-communist alliance, US returned, uh, returned Diao Yutai Island to Japan. Okay. And thus the movement I was heavily involved protecting Diao Yutai Island's movement began and last, lasted for several years. And 1970s to the present, Japan, uh, with the US support, uh, uh, has the constant uh, encroachment on Chinese sovereignty of Diao Yutai Island and bullying and humiliating Taiwan fishermen. Okay, next. Okay. And I, so here I want to insert. Uh, my personal story, then you will understand what I talk about actually, of course, have influence on an individual who was born in Taiwan. Uh, for, I was born in 1950 uh, of a, a poor peasant family in a small Han and Hakka village. Okay. Uh, I grew and educated in a village in southern Taiwan and then uh, a senior high and uh, university education uh, uh, in Taipei, uh, but I was ignorant and naive of political issues under martial law. You know, I was under martial law, of course, like everybody uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and then I had an advanced study at the University of Hawaii and with the East West Center Fellowship. And this is part of, I, I talk about the US ideolo ideological control with all kinds of incentives. And I got one of them. Yeah. Uh, but then I was enlightened uh, by the movement, you know, I went to uh, Hawaii and then the movement still going on and I was enlightened by the movement. And then my thought was uh, greatly transformed, I became a left activist. 
and I met and married my husband, who is a, a strong active, activist uh, uh, in this uh, movement. And we both involved and heavily uh, involved heavily in the protecting the island uh, movement and also uh, progressive uh, movements. And uh, in 19, uh, I didn't say the time here, 1996, the whole family, including our two daughters, <clears throat> returned to Taiwan. Both my husband and I uh, uh, um, were heavily involved in transformative movements in, uh, in Taiwan, including uh, protecting the Delta Island and, and the, the education. And um, my husband passed away in night, uh, 2015. Uh, and, uh, and we established, after he passed away, we established this association. And I was, uh, I, I'm the president of the association. Okay, next. So this history uh, uh, really uh, resonate with what uh, I talk about about the history in Taiwan and uh, the history of Delta Island. Very quickly, this is uh, the uh, in uh, in the U.S. Uh, the uh, protecting the island movement uh, picture. Next, next. Okay, and this is in Taiwan. Taiwan also has uh, this movement. And next. And, and this is, you know, after, after I was involved, I became the president of the Diao Yutai Education Association. And we were heavily involved to get, uh, uh, to collaborate with the fishermen. And this is one of them. Uh, uh, this fisherman was uh, uh, bellied by uh, uh, Japan and humiliated by uh, Japanese uh, 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 fleets and, uh, uh, and and then he returned and, and we went to visit him and he was extremely angry. And he talked about, you know, why I thought Diao uh, Yutai is ours, and, but how come uh, Japan treat me like that? Next. Okay, and this is a, a picture to show uh, the uh, red one is the Diao Yutai Island and the left of the China and then uh, lower part is Taiwan and then the right is uh, Japan. So it's really uh, the power relations uh, focus on here. Uh, next. And, and this is to show that the Diao Yutai Island is a very rich uh, fish farm, okay? And uh, because of this geographical, like uh, the black uh, currents, and then the, the, uh, it's the warm current and the cold currents from the, uh, from the north and uh, mixed together and become a very uh, rich uh, fish farm. Okay, next. Okay. And this is uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2012, Japan say uh, they want to nationalize uh, Diao Yutai Islands. Okay. And of course that stir big anger in many China and also in Taiwan and also among fishermen. So fishermen, um, have the like about 100 ships uh, 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 went to uh, Diao Yutai to protest. And this after the protest, they had this picture of Diao Yutai, this uh, island uh, with the fish, you know, that produce uh, or uh, grow in uh, that area. Uh, it's a very, it, very nice picture. And it's, this says uh, uh, Suhao. Suhao is the uh, uh, northern part of Taiwan. And it's, uh, major uh, 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 fish, fishing place. Um, and also the Diao Yutai Island is the major place they do, do the fishing. Yeah, next. Okay. And the main theme of the protecting the uh, Diao Yutai Island movement is very similar to the 1970s, whole, the whole world. Okay. The idealism, strong idealism, anti-imperialist, the anti-colonization, anti-militarism, anti-hegemony, anti-exploitation, anti-capitalism. This is uh, the main theme of uh, this uh, movement. And a strong passion, <clears throat> love the country, the people are uh, caring about the whole world and strong sense of justice. Learning from history, they very emphasize a lot about history and also had the international spirit perspective. Next. So um, <clears throat> with this protecting the island uh, movement, uh, 
I just say that, well, you know, it's a little shrimp against uh, the big whale, you know, ideological control is very difficult. But we just have to let progressive people like me as an example, and also my late husband as an example, we just have to use this uh, uh, aspect of the movement to, uh, to try to um, fight against the ideological control. And we have several approaches, educational camps, we have educational camps, exhibition, uh, critical analysis of textbooks, and protest symposiums, indigenous practice of uh, a tra traditional opera, documentary film of the movement, and we let the fishermen speak out. Okay. Uh, next, very quickly, I will show uh, the uh, pictures. Uh, uh, Brendan, uh, how, uh, am I over? <laughs> how much? Yeah, you're about, you're like two minutes over, but it's okay. 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 I, uh, you know, okay. Well, take away our time questions. Sure, thank you. Take your uh, time. And so th this is uh, the educational camp. You know, we gather the uh, people who are interested in the issue. We talk with them. We have like two days uh, camp to talk with them, and, and you know, have the educational uh, uh, analysis. Okay. Next. <clears throat> Next. Okay, and this is one of uh, the uh, uh, um, okay uh, uh, one of uh, the camps, and, and we did it in uh, Suao, which is uh, uh, the major uh, 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 harbor, uh, which uh, the fishermen will go to Jiao uh, Yutai to do their fishing. Okay, next. Okay, and this is we we also we went to the north, we went to the south for our educational camp. And this is in the south. Okay. Um, next. Next. Okay. And we also have like uh, a Diao Yutai movement, uh, protecting Diao Yutai movement, we have precious materials. And then uh, we, we try to uh, exhibit, you know, all these materials because in there, this historical, you know, political, economical, all of those important information uh, uh, to really let uh, Chinese uh, uh, people in Taiwan to understand. Okay, next, next. Okay. And, uh, and this is like we have uh, an, uh, uh, Liu Yuan who was heavily involved in the 1970 protecting the island movement to explain uh, these materials. Okay, next, next. And we have critical analysis of textbook. You, you all know that textbook is the most important channel uh, to do the ide ideological control. So we uh, critically analyze uh, the test work. We spent three years to do the research on that. And then we have the press conference. Next. Yeah. Okay. And we also have the protest. We, we you know, show our anger. Okay. And, and this is also in uh, northern part of Taiwan. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, fishermen. Okay. Uh, next. Next, quickly. And, and this is also, also the protest. Yeah. And it's my husband led uh, this uh, protest. Next. A another uh, uh, protest, and it's just recently a protest against Japan. And we went to uh, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, the consulate. I don't know whether that's the right word, you know, the, we call it the, uh, uh, the exchange. Uh, uh, between uh, Japan and, and Taiwan, uh, the, the office, uh, in front of the office, we protest. Okay, next. And another protest. I mean, there are a lot of contents, but I don't have the time to. Uh, you are welcome to look at our uh, uh, website. Okay, next. <clears throat> next. Okay, uh, the same thing. Okay, next. Uh, we have symposiums. And this is like, uh, last year, it was the uh, 50 years of protecting the island movement uh, started in the 50 years. We uh, celebrate uh, 50 years we had the symposium. Okay, next. 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 Brenda, next. Oh, next again. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, we also. Uh, and uh, try to integrate traditional opera with uh, a protecting island uh, theme, you know, the spirit. And uh, we have the people, indigenous people to uh, do the opera. Opera, we're using 
uh, traditional icons and ideas and and so we have this and and this uh, you can see that these are the ships you know representing the ships you know, fishermen's ships okay next next okay we also have that just uh, for this 50 years and tenure we uh produced a documentary film of the movement and we let the fishermen uh, speak up and this is and, and it's only on uh, one 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 or two minutes uh, show, so you can, uh, if uh, Brendan, you can show this, uh, this This is my last slide. Uh, can okay. you show? Uh, yeah, can you, can, let me know, oh, whoops. This hopefully you can hear it. Let me know if you can, um, one second, sorry. These are all fishermen. Sorry, we don't have the English translation. Okay. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Uh, the, okay, we are finished. Uh, and uh, the last uh, sentence said by this uh, fisherman, you know, uh, uh, he is the president of uh, the uh, Suao uh, uh, Su Fishermen's Association. He said that no sovereignty, no fishing right. Okay, he said that. That's one one very important. And the other one is uh, that I mean everybody here is uh, the fisherman. Okay, uh, in Taiwan, and one fisherman say that you know his uh, uh, ship was sank, sank, uh, and then he said he wanted to go down uh, with the with the ship. You know, and, and I mean this conflict between Japan and and Taiwan fishermen uh, has uh, many 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 examples. Okay, and and the woman was the, uh, the wife of uh, a fisherman who died because of uh, fishing, you know, in the, uh, uh, in Diao uh, Yutai uh, uh, seabed, okay. Uh, I mean, in Diao Yutai uh, fish farm, farm. So this, we, we try to use the documentary film to really relate with the uh, common people, relate with the fishermen and to, say what they what they feel and 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 i mean this is very clear that it's really against the ideological control because ideological control is not really that much related to the actual life okay and so this uh, uh, duck, duck film um, uh, we try to i mean one of the method to uh, 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 to uh, get through uh, break through the ideological control and then we that we need to do it for decades it's a long journey thank you thank you very much that was an excellent presentation and i guess i would suggest maybe um, if you'd like to to share the link to the protecting um Diao Yutai islands in the chat and the way people can find it a little easier um and i want to thank both our um presenters today thomas Huang and professor chen um did su sung make it in i couldn't see i guess not and okay in that case um we can open up if people have questions that they would like to ask Brandon, i've actually put a sent in the chat to you for, there's for not like i can start, start, start us up.
Brandon's screen is broken up at this point. They seem to have lost it. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, can you can you hear me now or no? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. So uh, let's. I see Kim. Uh, Kim Eng has her hand up. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself, and you can go ahead first. Yeah. Yeah. This is Kim Eng. I have a question and a comment uh, after reading part of the chat. The question is directed to Professor Chen. Can you please link up the struggle for the for Tiao Yi? Tiao Yi Tai Island uh, with the uh, China question. In other words, I understand that the fisherman talking about no sovereignty, no rights, but he's talking about Taiwan owning the, you know, part of taking over the sovereignty of the island by Taiwan from Japan, right? But how is that linked to the mainland, the question of uh, China, the mainland mm -hmm. China? The, 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 so that's the question. The, the comment I want to make is something that somebody put, I think Yuri put down saying that, why don't you let the people of Taiwan uh, have a referendum as to whether they want to belong to China or not? I think that's a very dangerous thought because you're not talking about people who have a blank slate, right? You're talking about 50 years of imperialist American propaganda and education that's distorted the, the, the identity of a people. And, and I, I don't believe that the referendum would be any reflection of reality in that situation. And, and, and that's where I would answer Yuri. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Can I just point out, I've sent you three questions in, in the chat, Chang uh, and, and one from uh, Jaga. So thank you. at some point take those because they did put the questions in the chat. Yeah, it was kind of, it was hard for me to look at the chat while I was sharing the screens. I should have uh, mentioned that. Uh, Brendan, sorry. Uh, yeah. I thought we were going to have uh, the commentator, uh, Professor uh, Xu Shen. Yes, I thought so too, but I, I'm not sure that they're here. I think he's, he's uh, on our, it, you know, I, I saw him. Yeah, oh, I sent a message to uh, Brandon, uh, but I guess he didn't see it. Um, Professor Xu Sen had uh, some urgent business. He had to he had to leave. He couldn't wait um, okay. to be discussant. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can go to the audience. I guess for now, and I have a, a couple questions, but we can start with the audience. And I guess whoever do you want to start by answering that question, um, Professor Chen, and then Thomas can go after. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, it's not clear. I thought we are going to have the Professor uh, Xu, Xu Shen to comment on our uh, Professor Huang and my uh, uh, talks. No? He, he left the conference already. He left oh, the meeting. Oh, he left. Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. But the question uh, was directed uh, to, to Misha. So do you want to try first, maybe? Uh, I'll okay. Keep it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh let's see and um, the the first question one is uh, about whether in this fishing right no sovereignty uh, fishing uh, no fishing right how china is related uh, i should say men and china <laughs> uh, uh, how is it related i i want to say that uh, you know i was talking i'm more familiar familiar with uh, the what's happening in uh, taiwan Although I know about China situation, but uh, I didn't talk about uh, the this protecting the island movement as it related to uh, 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 to China, to mainland China, and mainland China had some uh, movement. You know, they were involved in this movement, uh, but the more important thing is the fishermen. You know, some uh, Chinese fishermen, the fishermen from mainland China went to the uh, the Diao uh, Yutai uh, area uh, to do the fishing. Some of them were also bellied by uh, uh, Japan, okay, uh, the Japan's uh, uh, you know, official uh, fleet. 
and and uh, you know there are a lot of uh, uh, books on on that. Yeah. So so when I'm talking about what what I was talking about in Taiwan, and uh, you know, it's the same thing uh, about uh, 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 the fishermen uh, in uh, uh, mainland China. But I would also say that uh, you know, with the like fifty years of uh, humiliation by uh, Japan. Uh, uh, I see that uh, men in China, PRC, because it has the sovereignty, you know, I mean, it's strong. Uh, and so Japanese government or Japanese officials more uh, treat the fishermen from men in China more politely or more lightly and, and you know, less of the humiliation. And this is from what I, 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 I uh, I saw from the um, situation in Taiwan and mainland China, that's one. And then uh, the second question is about referendum, right? Okay, well, I, I agree with uh, uh, this uh, uh, woman uh, who uh, raised this question. Uh, I disagree, you know, because I, I just say that, you know, from my, uh, from my talk that uh, Taiwan, the, the ideology of Taiwanese people, you know, I mean, they, it's not their idea, it's not their ideas. It's really the ideological control that made them think that way. Okay, and, and it's like 90% of the, the, uh, 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 the Taiwanese people do not understand or, you know, they don't think that way. They don't think, you know, my analysis of, you know, why we have this Taiwan question. So. Having referendum uh, is not really it won't show the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fact, yeah, the truth. Yeah. So I I agree, agree with uh, um, um, uh, this uh, 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 woman. And and did I answer the question? I I think that was a a, a pretty good answer. Um... And I guess, Thomas, did you want to add anything or do you think it's okay because it was directed at uh, Prof uh, Professor Chen? Oh. Okay, I'll move on to um, one of the next questions from um, one of the, someone from the chat. Um, so no, 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 let's, uh, oh. let me, let me, let me okay. chip in a little bit with my, my very short answer. Uh, I, I think the original question was uh, the concept of territorial integrity versus self-determination, right of self-determination. Uh, and also the, uh, what will the Jiao Yutai issue fits in with the uh, cross-strait uh, relations. I think, first of all, I think this is a, sort of uh, dormant issue between China, mainland China, and the China and Japan. Uh, one day it was resurfaced. Uh, at this particular point, China is busy with the issue of Taiwan, probably pay, do, uh, doesn't pay too much attention to the issue of Diao Yutai, because it's uh, really a small island, although I, I understand it's vital to the interests of fishermen uh, in on Taiwan. However, uh, Deng Xiaoping said probably 30 or 35 years ago that the issue of Diao Yutai doesn't have to be, uh, you know, zero, zero sum game. Uh, it could be uh, controlled or they managed uh, by all interested parties. I think this is a very genius, uh, uh, you know, idea. In other words, he uh, could at that particular point, so many years ago, could transform or transcend the uh, the uh, very raw idea of military conflicts or whatever you know between two countries, to come up with an idea with common management. I think this has changed the nature of the uh, of the uh, of the dialogue. I think it's uh, probably in the future. Uh, there's uh, uh, at least I hope. There will be uh, both country can pursue this this uh, this, uh, this uh, course of actions, and not just for fishing right. There uh, there will be there may be potential um, oil huge oil deposit 
uh, on the sea. Uh, down the seabed uh, around the uh, Gyoita areas. Uh, that's uh, the first question. The uh, second question is, uh, well, the, 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 the right of uh, uh, self-determination. In my opinion, both the independence, the course of independence, and the course to exercise self-determination in order to get to the independence are both means for solving or for increase the welfare of the of the people. Now, there's no this is a relative question. There's no absolute answer to one or the other. I would uh, suggest to you that uh, you know one uh, senators, French senators uh, from the French uh, overseas territories once said, or people asking that. To be blank, why wouldn't you de uh, declare independence from France? After all, France France was uh, a colonial power, a notorious colonial power at one point. And his answer was uh, independence or unification with France, remaining there for the island to remain dependent territories of France. Both have their pros and cons. They are both legitimate means, according to the circumstances, for decolonization process. It The choice between is a resort. Whether the independence would increase the welfare of the residents or the other way around. So his answer is that uh, he and his uh, countrymen, or the um, countrymen, we can say that, prefer to stay with France as uh, part of the foreign territories because the outcomes are more uh, advantageous to the people on the islands. I'll give you the same answer for, for uh, Taiwan issues. Independence or uh, reunification. It depends on the outcome, depends on how you judge the situation. It's not absolute right or absolute wrong. I hope I answer your questions. Thank you. So uh, next Brenda, can Go I ahead. add a little bit to uh, the first part of uh, Professor Huang's uh, point about the uh, negotiation about uh, between Japan and Taiwan for the Diao Yutai fishing right, you know, uh, uh, that's point. And I think um, I can use uh, the, the history of uh, protecting the island uh, movement in Taiwan as an example to show that this does not work very well. Uh, and well, I mentioned to you that- uh, No, I, I was talking about the uh, negotiation between China and Japan. It's a totally different situation. Taiwan okay. is too small <laughs> to say, uh, to say uh, bluntly. Okay, well, well that's okay. But but uh, what I'm saying is that um, negotiation. Uh, well, now nah, uh, Zhou and I also mentioned that uh, the negotiation between uh, Japan or China or Taiwan. Well, of course, Taiwan does does not have enough power, but Taiwan did have the negotiation with Japan about the fishing right in Diao Yutai for 17 years until tw uh, uh, 2012, when uh, uh, Japan wanted to nationalize uh, Diao Yutai. And then there was a huge uh, protest about the fishermen, you know, also in, in China and, and, and Taiwan. So um, we have Japan, this under, under that pressure, uh, Japan started negotiating with Taiwan and say that, okay, we, we can have uh, Taiwan and Japan, the fish and right uh, treaty. Uh, and so then uh, the fishermen in Taiwan gained some, uh, 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 some uh, area for their fishing. But this area of fishing uh, in 19, uh, uh, 2013 decreased every year. They had to negotiate. 
and uh, Taiwanese uh, fishermen and Taiwanese officials have to negotiate with Japan every single year. And every single year, the area where they gain a uh, control of all the fishing uh, in uh, uh, 2013 decrease every year. So I, I'm just using this uh, example to say that, well, negotiate, uh, negotiating, even Chinese, China, I know China, you know, quite strong in the position, uh, and negotiating with uh, Japan, uh, we cannot have uh, too strong expectation. We need to understand the history of Jap Japanese uh, hegemony. Okay, this is, I want to add to uh, uh, the previous discussion. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the question from um, Chen Chan Chi Kun, and I'll just go to your, I'll just choose one question from you. Um, just because there's three other people. So could the panelists comment on the report, uh, the repeated attempts to relocate uh, TSMC to Arizona and the 2 million Taiwanese working, living, studying on the mainland slash HK, Hong Kong's or Macau? So that is not directed to anyone specifically. Is you able to try? Or do you want me to move? Sorry, I, I, I just... Get, well, let me, uh, that was the time, can... time is precious. So let, me, let me give a brief answer. Uh, uh, when I returned back to Taiwan to uh, lecture on the uh, cross strait relationship relations, the people were telling me, well, the China is not going to attack Taiwan. No, I said, why? Well, because uh, Taiwan is a semiconductor. That's a uh, sort of uh, citadel uh, that uh, China could. Can simply cannot afford to destroy or whatever. I said it's all really on the contrary. If there is a conflict, military conflict between the United States and China, then Taiwan semiconductor facilities will become a burden for Taiwan because if the United States uh, determine that uh, it cannot effectively fend off uh, the military forces from China. Oh, what would the United States do? Of course, it would destroy it to prevent it from falling into the hands of, of, of the Chinese government. Now, later on, the United States uh, government became a little bit wiser. So, all right, maybe we cannot defend, effectively defend Taiwan, but he was keeping uh, semiconductor from falling into Chinese hand once there is a middle of conflict. Let's move it, in my opinion, it's steal it from Taiwan and move the entire factory and, and the people with know-how to Arizona. That's what is happening at this particular point. So even if there will be a military conflict between China and the United States in the future, it doesn't matter that much. It gives the United States government a lot more options to maneuver. It, the semiconductor is important to national defense of the United States, but it's become less important because now the United States has uh, the know-how and the cap capability to produce what hopefully the United States will need. And <clears throat> Professor Chen, did you want to answer that question as well? Well, well uh, the only point I, I can... can... Yeah. Sorry. The the only uh, point I want to uh, raise, raise or, or respond is, uh, uh, you know, historically, a uh, KMT and DPP's policy is pro America, and is very much controlled by the U.S. You know, we we have so much, so many discussions uh, among the progressive that uh, uh, the the uh, the KM, uh, KMT or the uh, DPP uh, officials, uh, you know, before they become the president, they have to go to the U.S. for interviews. Okay, you know, I'm just using example to show that the U.S. has really very uh, strong influence uh, on Taiwan. Well, you know, not only on Taiwan, on other part of the world. Uh, so Taiwan has not. Well, at least for the current uh, regime uh, or the administration. Uh, it's very difficult to have its own, or, well, actually they don't want to, 
you know, because in order to become independent, they have to depend on uh, the U.S. So it's very difficult to, or, or, or you know, they don't want to have a, a so-called independent uh, policy about TSMC. You know, uh, so this to me is not very surprising. And also the intellectuals uh, in Taiwan, and many of them see that very clearly. In you know, is uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, you know as the hegemony uh, is really doing its own thing, and they wanted to to uh, use Taiwan as uh, as as a uh, way of reaching uh, that uh, purpose. Uh, so uh, that to me, it's not very uh, surprising. So that's the one uh, I want to add. Okay, thank you. So and. I actually have a question that I prepared that I that I'll that I'll ask. We're approaching eleven, so feel free to give shorter answers if you like. Um, we'll probably go a little bit over time and just ask the remaining um, three questions that we have here. Um, so this is in regards to the recent local elections where they came to one majority of seats, and I'm just wondering if you think that um, Taiwanese people saw the way the U.S. is using Ukraine as a pawn to advance its own geopolitical gains against Russia. Um, as a warning of continuing to side with the, the DPP and its allegiance to Washington? Or um, do you think they're trying to avoid, avoid such a similar outcome as being used as a pawn in Washington's geopolitical game? And that's not to make a similarity uh, between Russia and Ukraine and Taiwan, but just to say, are they trying to avoid a similar being used as a pawn? Or do you think the result of the local elections was um, something else? And anyone? <laughs> well, let me, let me say, uh, let me give you a short answer first. I think it's very difficult to uh, gauge uh, the public uh, sen sentiments correctly. Uh, there are many reasons that uh, the, the current government of PBD uh, just lost local elections. Uh, I think, first of all, the issue of Ukraine, of course, raises the consciousness of Taiwanese people. They suddenly realize that the war between uh, China and the United States and uh, uh, on, on the Taiwan Strait is uh, very much a likelihood. Like uh, is likely to happen in the future. It's, it, it's not taken. Uh, if not uh, uh, deal with carefully. Uh, that is some sort of anti-war or uh, sentiments among the voters. Whether this factor is decisive, I cannot say. But the definite answer to the loss a more definite answer to the, to the loss of election by the current PBT government is that uh, some of their policies are very poor and the officials are extremely corrupt. And uh, it's totally contrary, contrary to the expectation, reasonable expectation from the, uh, from the average voter. So of course, the PBT party still has maybe 30 some percent of uh, diehard followers. But most of the independent voters, I think, see through what the PBT government is doing and they don't like it. That's why they voted the party out in spite of the fact that some of the candidates from the KMT party are not thrilled either, are not excellent either. They are, they are very common, they are mediocre and some even have uh, corrupt history. But that's beside the point because they want to show PVT party that uh, uh, people are really not satisfied with what things uh, have, uh, have been uh, happening. Right. Uh, uh, Brendan, I want to say something about this question. I, I think to address uh, this question, we need to do some class analysis of Taiwanese people. Oh, that's my first point. Uh, the second point is, well, if we do this class analysis, you will find that, well, of course, majority of the Taiwanese people were very much, uh, 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 you know, ideologically controlled or influenced. But there are some uh, 
you know, very grassroots uh, people, I would say like my, my brother, you know, they, they're very clear. You, they can see very clearly the cross-strait relations are the, you know, the, those people on the top, you know, and, but like we, we Chinese, uh, we, we think differently. Well, you can fight uh, and then you can, you can uh, uh, who's the winner, you know, uh, we'll see. Uh, but with the, for the Chinese people, uh, you know, we, we are, you know, we, we are people, we are together. So, and then also for the intellectuals, it's very interesting to me that, you know, in the, among the intellectuals in Taiwan, some are very, very uh, ideologically oriented toward uh, the U.S., you know, uh, the anti-communist, uh, 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 everything. Uh, but there are some intellectuals, for example, there's a program uh, uh, in Taiwan, which is very popular, I, I think very popular, Xinwen Da Bai Hua. Yeah, news um, very much like ordinary people news. The speakers in, in this program are very, you know, very clear and uh, they're very anti the US, <laughs> which really surprised me. And so, so you will see that, you know, there are different uh, that aspect uh, toward this question, depending on uh, uh, which part of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Taiwanese people you were talking about. Right. Okay, thank you. So our next question, um, sorry, some uh, Jaeger. So it seems that uh, most discussions um, are about Taiwan and imperialist America. What about China? Do you guys think it is capitalist imperialist or not? Uh, uh, Brendan, I, I saw one question. A very good question, but I, I, I think we might not have enough time, but I want to uh, 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 to say that this question is very good and, and we the one in the chat time for discussion. It, it so, seems that most discussions are about Taiwan and imperialist America. What about China? Do you guys think China's capitalist and imperialist or not? Yeah. <laughs> I think you know that needs to be addressed. Uh, but then for our current, for me, for our current issue, uh, uh, if we want to advance, you know, like if IMG uh, uh, want to have more uh, panels like this, we can we can talk about this. This is a big issue. Do you want to go ahead and answer? Sorry, I, I asked. Maybe I cut out while I was asking. But if you want to go ahead and answer that question, I think it is a good question. Um, <laughs> Now, the other thing I want to say is that among our audience, I know you know several several uh, people are my uh, friends. They are very good. <laughs> they even better than I. You know, like Song uh, Xiaomei, Lin Shenjian, Yan Hailong. I think they can also address this question. It doesn't have to be only Tom and I. Uh, I mean, I can I can answer, but uh, uh, it would be good to have the audience uh, uh, response. Um. Yeah, we, I mean, you guys are the, the speakers, you are the stars of the show, but if, 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 if um, Hairong or someone else if, wants to answer, they can go ahead. Otherwise, maybe we can just go ahead with uh, you, Professor Chen, but. I, I have a very short answer for the, uh, for, for the questions. I think it uh, doesn't serve too much purpose for, uh, in terms of uh, uh, enlightened discussion to categorize China either as uh, capitalist or socialist or colonialist or whatever. You know, we we have to examine uh, the the facts and uh, see the issues in context, not to use the abstract categories to uh, to uh, restrict our observation. That's uh, number one. Secondly, I, uh, yeah, that's that's my answer. Okay, okay. well, I, I can say a little bit uh, um, uh, uh, regarding this question. Um, I think it, it, we are talking about protecting the island movement. I mean, it's very clear. China's stand very clear and very strong. You know, I mean, the uh, 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 Chinese officials going to Japan and talking about this, they're very extremely strong. 
I mean, and in that sense, I think it's, it is very, very important uh, for what I am doing, you know, in terms of uh, the protecting uh, the island. Okay. So if we want to kind of analyze uh, 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 China, whether it's going to capitalist and imperialist, uh, uh, just like the US, you know, we need to do more, more analysis, but uh, I, I think we need to do it more dynamically you know, in different stages and, and, and their policy. I mean, I, I would say, for example, uh, the PRC's uh, uh, policy toward Taiwan has changed, you know, for the last few decades. And, and during most time, you know, they're very clear that, well, I, I want to liberate Taiwan. Well, <laughs> you know, because Taiwan is a capitalist and we are the socialist. So, so uh, during the uh, uh, more the old time, uh, is that way. but then uh, later they had to adjust to the changes in the uh, capitalist uh, world. Uh, but the, uh, indeed, with the change of uh, the more of uh, China going to more capitalist uh, uh, road, uh, the policy toward uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, I mean the. The problems with the uh, the policy toward Taiwan. I mean, at the, in the in the past um, few years, uh, they've been negotiating with the uh, the KMT or P uh, DPP on the top. You know, those uh, uh, um, officials. They want to negotiate with the officials, not the people in Taiwan. I mean, that that to me is you know part of uh, the. Uh, uh, Taiwan policy, China, uh, mainland China's Taiwan policy that needs to be analyzed and uh, 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 you know profoundly is very difficult. And Taiwan's uh, uh, the fact that Taiwan become more uh, leaning toward uh, independence. You know, I mean the support. You can see that uh, 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 map uh, uh, the figure that I show that uh, that. Uh, the support for independence uh, in Taiwan has been in the past two or three decades have been you know increasing. Well, what's the reason? I, I mentioned about the ideological control. You know, that's more of the outside, but also the internal. You know, internal. I mentioned about uh, the new capitalist uh, class, the new rise capitalist class. But China, you know, many China's uh, policy toward Taiwan is also very important, and we need to analyze that. Uh, so, so uh, I, I would, I, you know, I, I think the issue of whether uh, China becomes uh, more capitalist and imperialist that's a separate issue we can talk about. But uh, in re re relation to what. Uh, we discussed uh, here more of the Taiwan in, uh, Taiwan uh, 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 question or the relationship between cross trade. I think there are some things that can be that, that are concrete that we can analyze. You know, for example, I say that mainland China's policy toward Taiwan needs to be analyzed, and that could be one of uh, the uh, factors that lead to more independence, more separation. That could be one of them, and that needs to be uh, analyzed. Okay. So we are, uh, I guess, almost 10 minutes. But I guess the, uh, the issue of uh, whether China is imperial power uh, uh, kept on coming up uh, on my screen. So I, let me give a very short answer to that, to that question. I remember about a year ago, I saw a program uh, from Australia, uh, a very noted uh, journalist invited six experts from various universities in Austria to discuss uh, China's situation. And one of one, you know, a, a few, two or three people, when they described China, they just, just came out naturally by assuming that China has the so-called uh, global ambition, at least uh, territorial ambitions or expense, expansionist ambition with regard to Southeast Asia. <laughs> it was 
uh, the two of the experts say that there is absolutely no evidence to show that China has any kind of colonial or uh, imperialist uh, tendencies. Uh, people sometimes say things uh, out of their uh, what they learned during their formative years without re-examine uh, what they have come to believe as true. Sometimes it's totally without any evidence to support that kind of ideology. I want to remind uh, participants in the audience, it's very important for us to reflect on what we have learned or have been told by other people as to what China is or could be or is intended to be. Uh, very carefully. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I think China's um, experience with colonialism, it doesn't want to repeat that for other people, but that's just my thought. And so we are about 10 minutes over. Um, there were a few more questions asked, but I don't want to keep people here too long. So I'm going to ask uh, maybe one more question. Um, should Taiwan itself, I think well, we already covered this question um, about the referendum. So I'll go on to the next one. Um, wouldn't Taiwanese agree U.S. Uh, wouldn't Taiwanese agree U.S. broke um, maybe brokered agreement with PRC about one China policy the same as U.S. Oh, sorry. Wouldn't Taiwanese agree U.S. broke agreement with PRC about one China policy the same as U.S. broke agreement with um, Federation of Russia, uh, NATO moving east, and Ukraine has had no sovereignty at all since 2014. It is a proxy state of the U.S., while, while Taiwan is a maritime region of PRC, has had a provincial sovereignty, though it is actually not a country. I, don't, I, I must admit that I don't quite understand the nature of the question. Um, I can hear you, Brenda. Neither do I this, who this was from. Um, it was from Robert. I don't know if they want to expand on that question, or maybe in that case we can uh, maybe we can just decide. I saw the next question. And there. Excuse me, uh, Brandon. I I believe Yuri has his hand up. Uh, Oh, we seem to be losing Brandon. Yeah, the, the connection uh, seems problematic. Uh, well, here's one more. Yeah, my internet, I can hear people. Good, Brandon, then. Perhaps uh, while Brandon is sorting out his connection, we could ask Yuri if he, he wanted to pose his question. I, he's had his hand up for a while. Yuri? That's what we should do, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Hi there, and forgive me for looking ridiculous. It's very late right now, and uh, I, <laughs> I am under the weather, so apologies for that. <laughs> uh, my question, although it's kind of been answered uh, before, but I'll just say it again, is why is, uh, is in order for, you know, this whole Taiwan question to finally advance forward and we don't have this constant uh you know tug of war between uh between US imperialism and China is yeah why not why not why not we just settle the question of Taiwan with an independent with 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 a referendum on independence or reunification with China but the conditions is that you know if China uh, if Taiwan becomes independent no to U.S. military bases and foreign bases, and um, and if you know Taiwan wants to become reunified with uh, China, uh, what uh, you know would a lot would uh, would Chiang Kai Shek with a lot of his legacy be eradicated, or or uh, or what or what would be uh, the debates going forward on uh, him and, and within the academia world and the media world? Thank you. Well, I'll try to answer that. 
uh, it's a it, it's a very abstract and uh, ideal concept uh, to say that people should have a right to referendum. But in the real world, there is baseline that uh, is, is some other people, in, in this case, PRC, simply cannot allow uh, to be crossed. And Taiwan independence is one of those issues. If it is shown or is known that the referendum will lead to the factual or legal separation of Taiwan from China, China would not allow it. I think we can probably um, phrase the referendum in a way just like uh, people in Northern Ireland, Catholic in Northern Ireland, to allow people in Taiwan to express whether they would immediately unify with China or maintain some kind of status quo without becoming factually or legally independent. That is a slight possibility that China may agree to that. Other than that, if it's an open question, asking Taiwanese people whether they want to have independent and complete separation from mainland China or unification with China in the future. I don't think China is going to gamble on that particular issue. And uh, as, as uh, Professor Chen pointed out, there are a lot of factors which uh, need to be taken into consideration. This is not exercise of some abstract natural right for people. The Taiwan has been under the heavy control of KMT with, uh, with uh, you know, the absolute uh, anti-communist uh, uh, propaganda uh, for, for, for 50, at least 50, 60 years. And uh, has also been under the influence of the US uh, propaganda machines for so long. Uh, I don't think Chinese government would expect that uh, Taiwan people will really know how to express their uh, will and their hope, their the, the decision, uh, um, at least from their point of view, uh, favorable to to China. So this is uh, some issue which uh, we can talk about in abstract but it's not going to happen in reality. Well, uh, no, just a, a one point uh, that, I mean, I'm, I have great suspicion about Western democracy. <laughs> I mean, I think most people will have, a, a lot of intellectuals you know, have uh, problems with the, uh, the Western democracy, liberal democracy. And I think referendum is along that kind of uh, stream of thought. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 Taiwanese, I mean, they, they are, you know, dynamic. And I, if I look at my, uh, if I talk with my brother, who is very much grassroots person, not very highly educated, but, you know, very wise, okay. Well, that, how was the percentage of people like him? We need to understand more. And but a lot of uh, uh, people definitely after decades of ideological uh, control, you know, you, can, you cannot expect very much. They need, you know, re-education. Uh, that's uh, uh, what, what I think. And also we really need to do class analysis. Here, there's, a, I think, a very good question from Chen Ji Kong. Uh, and uh, it's a question for me. He, he said that, uh, he or she said that the two million Taiwanese, you know, there are two million Taiwanese living, working, studying on the mainland. Uh, and, and also, they, of course, they keep their networks uh, with Taiwan. And he said that uh, that makes ideological control quite a challenge. Okay. And uh, uh, he or she asked that. But I, also with this, I would do some more of a, a class analysis. You know, the Taiwanese people who went there uh, also have uh, a different point of view. 
There are some that are very much like uh, the the ninety percent or very high percent of the Taiwanese in Taiwan because they they are also very much ideological controlled. You know, it, 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 we all know that it's very difficult to get out of. Uh, the ideological control. So I, I know that, you know, when I uh, went to China, I mean, there's a lot of my friends uh, uh, working in mainland China, uh, uh, teaching in mainland China, they will say that a lot of uh, 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 Taiwanese, you know, uh, uh, have very similar anti-communist, anti anti-Chinese. You know, they have their, that kind of thinking a lot. But of course, you know, we, we need to see how this will progress, you know, with China becoming more stronger or, you know, their policy, uh, I mean, like their policy toward Africa, their policy toward Middle East. And, and, uh, it seems to me that they, they're very different from uh, the US imperialist. And, and that would also, is a very, uh, 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 important uh, uh, happenings uh, that needs to be uh, analyzed. And people definitely will see, you know, they will see uh, like the intellectuals in this news, uh, uh, ordinary people news, uh, uh, they all say very clearly that, you know, uh, China has been doing things that are more toward uh, the disadvantaged uh, countries, you know, and, and whether that would uh, uh, that would uh, influence uh, uh, people uh, who have been ideologically controlled, as wait to see. We we have to uh, dynamically analyze uh, uh, what is going going to happen. And one very important, I think, that related to uh, IMG and related to the progressives in China, the mainland China in Taiwan, is like how, how effectively we work, you know, as progressive, the progressive uh, uh, movement. And I mean, we, if we do well, that would also have uh, some influence uh, on the people, you know, uh, and also that uh, they would gain different kind, they would, they would, uh, 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 be exposed to different kind of uh, analysis, and then that would affect their uh, ideology. You know, just like what we do about this textbook. That, you know, a lot of people very surprised that uh, the uh, uh, the government uh, in the textbook say that well, you know, Diao Yutai belongs to Japan, Diao Yutai belongs to China, Diao Yutai belongs to Taiwan, and we don't have a stand. You know, I mean that kind of things uh, that we need to do. Uh, analysis and and that I think if we do it well. I think that would affect uh, uh, the 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 big trend. Like I say, you know, the increasing of like I I'm I'm not Chinese. I'm Chi I'm Taiwanese. Would influence uh, influence uh, the the big trend, and that <laughs> we need to work hard. <clears throat> okay. Um... I think in that case, I think we have one more question and I'll frame it as the final question because we are running out of time here. We're, well, sorry, we're well out of time. Um, so this question was from uh, Chen Chi Kun. Um, so how serious, I guess before I ask the question, feel free to add any final remarks before we wrap up. Um, so how serious less urgent is the problem of the Taiwanese educational systems brainwashing of cohorts of Taiwanese primary and secondary school students? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the question is to uh, my uh, uh, discussion about uh, the test books. Very serious, I have to say. <laughs> the brainwashing, very serious. And uh, KMT and DPP, you know, they, they're in the same stand, you know, they're not that different. Ideologically, they are not different, okay. So, and you, you know, KMT was defeated by uh, CCP you know, so so it's very clear that uh, uh, KMT would be anti-communist, and then the DPP, you know, would is uh, in in oh, what's a good word inheritance of uh, the uh, the uh, uh, administration, even more, you know, because the other like newly 
rise uh, uh, new capitalist uh, class. You know, they want to be uh, in control. <laughs> And, you know, we are the uh, uh, rich people. We we are very uh, 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 creative. You know, you can see very clearly uh, with the DPP's uh, uh, response uh, 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 policy or responses about the uh, uh, COVID nineteen. It's very clear that they want uh, to be the leader uh, of uh, uh, Taiwan. They they don't want to be part of. Uh, 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 China. Okay, so what I'm saying is that it's been 50 years, you know, decades of uh, ideological control and, and education has been that way. So it's very difficult that the voice, you know, I mentioned about that we spent three years to do analysis of the textbook, and I mean we are the very what's the good word, My, very minor <laughs> among the, uh, the, the voices. We are very, you know, it has not been heard widely. And, and so that, that's from our Diao Yutai, protecting the Diao Yutai Island perspective. But also the textbook has been very much, uh, what's the word for that, de -sinicization. <laughs> It's very clear, you know, I mean, like they, they changed the history. They change Taiwan history. They change uh, Taiwan's modern history. Okay, so so I would say that well, uh, serious and urgent. <laughs> we we have a lot of work to do. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. Or sorry, Thomas. Would you like to add anything? And you're muted, by the way. The short answer is no. Uh, Professor Chen answered, answered them all perfectly. Okay. So I guess in that case, we should probably wrap up as we're about almost approaching half an hour over. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended today and contributed to the discussion. I definitely learned a lot. And obviously, thank you to our two amazing speakers, uh, Professor Chen and uh, Thomas Huang. You guys were awesome. And thank you to everyone from IMG who helped organize this. Paul and Alan specifically. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.